Last year, a friend emailed me a link to a website that she was really excited about that she said had really great political commentary. And I was really busy and I never got to it. And um, a while later, she emailed me back and said, don't bother, because she had drilled down and found that the core belief of this political website was that Bush and Cheney are lizards from outer space. <laughs> Which, you know, the more I thought about it, it's as good as any other explanation I've heard. But, <laughs> but the more I thought about it, what stuck with me was, yes, indeed, there are lizards among us. In fact, there are actually lizards in us. From a biological perspective, one of the features that makes us human is that our brain actually has three distinct sub-brains. And the most ancient one, of course, is the lizard brain. And it deals with pure survival encoded with the primeval instincts for breathing, for getting food, and for fight and flight, and stuff like that. Now, lizards have no emotions whatsoever. They're essentially disinterested in their young, unless perhaps occasionally it's to eat them. So that's the lizard brain. Then there's the famed neocortex, the much celebrated you know, by Western civilization part of our brain that um, we've exalted for the last several millennia. And it gives us our intellectual abilities for reason, for problem solving, for speech, things like that. And then lastly, there's the limbic brain, which harbors perhaps our most unique qualities as mammals. It gives us feelings, empathy, and all the capacity that we have for emotional connection. It's why mammals have such long gestation periods and parental nurturance to wire our emotional intelligence. So I started to wonder, what if these wily, cold-blooded lizards have somehow learned to pluck our limbic strings? What if they're casting a lizardly spell over us to manipulate our ancient reptilian instincts? What if these lizards are not from outer space and they're right here among us? And what if they've staged a silent, invisible coup d'etat using the most dangerous technology of the 20th century, public relations? <laughs> Is there any way to break the reptilian spell? Well, as a psychotherapist, Tom Hartman thinks about such things. He's studied them closely, in fact. He trained intensively in neuro-linguistic programming with Richard Bandler, who's the co-founder of NLP. Um, he, was the he was the originator of the revolutionary hunter-farmer hypothesis, a major leap in understanding the psychiatric condition known as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a subject on which he's written numerous books, actually. But Tom is a polymath who has had several careers, enough to last several lifetimes. In fact, just reading his biography in itself is an education. He's been a radio veteran since 1968, and he's probably best known for the current show, the very, very popular left of center uh, talk show on um, nationally syndicated on Sirius Satellite that has just been picked up for syndication by Air America and is also streamed on the internet. But his achievements in radio are really just a tiny slice of his overall accomplishments. Tom is also a renowned innovator in the fields of psychology, ecology, and economics, a scholar of American history and the Constitution, an award-winning best-selling author of 14 books, including The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, The Edison Gene, Unequal Protection, We the People, and What Would Jefferson Do? He's an entrepreneur who has founded seven companies, He's the former executive director of a residential treatment program for emotionally disturbed and abused children. And he's helped set up hospitals and schools and communities for um, vulnerable children throughout the world. And he's an internationally known speaker on culture and communications who has reached thousands of people on, I think, five continents over the last two decades. He's also helped set up hospitals, famine relief programs, schools and communities for orphaned children in India, Uganda, Australia, Colombia, and the United States. He's a peripatetic traveler who has often found himself in the hot spots around the world when they spontaneously combusted. He was in, just to name a few, in the Philippines when Marcos fled the country. He was in Egypt when Sadat was shot. He was in Germany when the wall came down. He was in Beijing during the first student demonstrations. And he was in the West Bank town of Nablus in Israel when the Intifada started there. 
And fi finally, he was in Czechoslovakia on the border the week that Chernobyl melted down. Right place at the right time, the right man. <laughs> But perhaps Tom's greatest gift to all of us is as one of our most penetrating and really uh, brilliant thinkers on cultural, political, and environmental subjects. In contemplating the deepest underpinnings and possible solutions to the world's ecological and civilizational crisis, he suggests that many of our problems are grounded in cultural stories that go back thousands of years. He says that history demonstrates that when stories change, the world changes. So while the lizards among us have been whipping up enough spin to knock the earth off its axis, Tom has been patiently weaving a new story to break the spell. Please join me in welcoming one of the truly great visionaries of our time, the limbically literate Tom Hartman. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here at Bioneers uh, for the second year now, and, and uh, what Kenny and Nina and everybody else have done is a truly extraordinary work. This is changing the world. This, this is the, the butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil that creates the cyclone you know, off the coast of Africa or something. This is the beginning of it all, and it's just a, a, I am so pleased to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Um, I, I remember way back when I was first uh, it was 20 years ago or so when I was first starting to study uh, psychotherapy and psychology and, and hooked up with Richard Bandler and he was, uh, <laughs> we were in a room with a, there were a bunch of people there, uh, virtually all of them were healthcare professionals, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists in large part. And Bandler was talking about the importance of the stories that we tell ourselves, which is the theme that runs through most of my books. It's uh, you know, w without wandering off onto that, but uh, he was talking about the importance of the stories that we tell ourselves and how we actually have internal dialogues and we tell ourselves stories about what's going on. We're monitoring the world um, and, and discussing it with ourselves. Uh, Auspensky, actually, in, in Tertiarium Organatum or in uh, The Fourth Way, talks about this in some more detail. But in any case, there was, there was a psychologist in the room who speaks up and he says, uh, he says, you don't really mean to say that people have conversations inside their heads and that's normal. And, 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 and Bandler says, uh, yeah, I abso absolutely mean to say that. In fact, you know, one of the most therapeutic things you can do is figure out what people's conversations are and figure out if they're healthy conversations and if they're not, help them make them healthy conversations. And the guy says, no, come on. You, you look in the psychiatric manuals, people having conversations with themselves in their heads, that's a psychiatric illness. These people are mentally ill. And so Bandler turns to him and he says, well, have you ever had a patient who had conversations inside their own head? And the guy says, oh, yeah, yeah, just last week I had a guy come in and he was telling me about this long conversation he was having with himself about whether or not he should divorce his wife. And Bandler turns to him and he says, and, and, and what did you say to him when he told you about this internal conversation? And the guy, or, or no, and Bandler says, excuse me, and Bandler says to him, and what did you say to yourself when he told you about this internal conversation? <laughs> and the guy says, I said to myself, this guy's nuts. The, this, is, this is really the, you know, this is really what I want to talk about today, is this, the stories that we tell ourselves, not just as you and me telling ourselves stories about who we are and where we fit into the world and what it's all about and what's going on and what's happening over there and all that, you know, um, uh, kind of Buffalo Springfield stuff, but, but in, a, in a larger sense, the stories about democracy, the stories about uh, what we call liberty and freedom, uh, the, the stories about the founding of this nation, the stories about humanity, the stories about what it means to be an, a citizen of the United States, what it, needs, it means to be a citizen of the world, the stories of what it ultimately means to be human. There are a bunch of different levels at which this stuff gets communicated. And what I, what my goal for this, this 25 minutes with you today is to share with you some of those technologies, some of those techniques. Everybody is a communicator. The bottom line is we all communicate constantly. We're all trying to communicate in order to, to accomplish some end, whether it's to get fed or, you know, I mean, there's a million reasons why people communicate, but we're all doing it all the time. It's just some people are very competent at it, some people are very incompetent at it. And the goal, of course, is to become more competent at it. If you combine that competence of communications with some, you know, good ethical base, then, then you know, you have a force that can be a very powerful and useful thing. 
Hitler combined a, a competence of communication with the lack of an ethical base and, and did incredible harm, uh, as I would th say there are others in our country at this moment are doing as well. So just like a scalpel, this sort of thing can be used to heal or it can be used to wound. Uh, you know, I just want to preface all this. And yet, the, the bottom line is these are the simple tools of communication that, that, that people use. The first, of course, is framing. Framing is one of the oldest pieces of NLP. Um, my, my first work on attention deficit disorder was to reframe attention deficit disorder. I, you know, our, my son was diagnosed with it when, 15 years ago, and when he was diagnosed with this, the guy sat him down and told him that he had a mental illness. It devastated him. And I thought, there's got to be a better way to say this. And so I came up with this idea that kids with ADD were really hunters in a world full of farmers. And actually now, you know, the science is in my last book on this topic. is called The Edison Gene. Um, it, it's true, actually. And this is actually a gift and a positive thing. And, you know, something that I've been saying for, for 15 years. And, and uh, now science is catching up and saying, yeah. But my main goal was to create a story, because we all need stories, to create a story that these kids could use to get themselves through the day, and not just get themselves through the day, but to accomplish the extraordinary things that they are capable of. So that's, that's a frame, that, you know, the, 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 this story. Now, frames can be used to include or exclude things, and this is where they can be very useful or dangerous. For example, uh, the, a wealthy person dies and leaves behind an estate. That estate is going to be transferred to somebody else. Traditionally in our society, we have this kind of cultural consensus that when we transfer money from one person to another, that there are certain boundaries on that. For example, uh, we can give up to 10, 000, a parent can give up to $10,000 to their children without it being a taxable event, but after that they have to start paying taxes on it. And so, you know, we've, we've agreed that we don't want a landed gentry in the United States. We fought a revolution against that uh, with England, that there are certain appropriate limits to extreme wealth, and therefore there should be a, a t that, that when an estate is transferred from a person who lo no longer exists to somebody else, that, that there should be a tax on that. It's called the estate tax. Well, when you ask Americans if they're in favor of an, of an estate tax, about 80 percent of them will say yes. If, on the other hand, you ask Americans if they're in favor of a death tax, about 80 percent of them will say no. We're talking about the same tax here. So it's a matter of the frame. I mean, it's just a very simple. And, and a frame can be as simple as simply changing one word. So, you know, becoming, becoming very conscious about that. Um, gay marriage, the, the gay marriage issue, um, uh, civil unions, all these sorts of things. I wrote an op-ed for Common Dreams a year and a half, two years ago, when this was really firing up, uh, titled Blame It on Jefferson. And my point was, let's re this is not about gay marriage. This is about civil rights. Are we going to extend civil rights to all the members of our society? And that's the frame that, you know, is increasingly, you know, being uh, uh, gotten by people. There's been a historic battle in the United States between corporations and labor about, you know, a living wage versus what they call the right to work. The 1947, the Taft-Hartley bill, which, which uh, it's, without going into the whole long story of it, basically said, you know, basically it was a right to fire bill, but they called it the right to work, you know, and so, you know, it's the, these are frames. Um, the right to life movement, I think this is really fascinating. On my radio show on Friday, I had a, a, a Republican attorney on who was talking about how life begins at conception. Now, I consider myself pro-life in as much as I'm all in favor of life. I'm not in favor of the taking of life. I'm opposed to capital punishment. Um, I, you know, I, and, and, and as a man, and as the father of three children, I can't imagine having watched my wife go through three pregnancies, what it would be like to be a woman and be carrying a baby. I mean, it's a, I, you know, pers my personal take on this is, with regard to the whole abortion issue, is that men shouldn't even be allowed to vote on the issue because we can't understand it. But in any case, this, this woman was on the program and she was putting out her frame of, well, life begins at conception. And so my question was, okay, if life begins at conception, when somebody has a miscarriage, should there be a funeral? Uh, well, about 50% of, you know, fertilized ovums never get implanted. Does that mean that we should be having funerals for every other menstrual period? Um, and, then, and then the kicker, okay, if, if life begins at conception and abortion is murder, then do you want to put women to death who have abortions by uh, hanging, by electrocution, or by lethal injection? I mean, you know, if you're going to criminalize abortion, what are the criminal penalties going to be? Uh, we don't talk about that, right? And so it's like, let's redefine the frames. And so, you know, these are just, you know, some, a few of the political, um, some of the, the more political ones. Some of the weakest of the frames out there 
are the ones that are simply lies. The, the, the George Orwell frames, the, the, the Clear Skies initiative. You know, it's, it, people are increasingly realizing this is about putting more, more mercury in the air. You know, the, the, the Healthy Forests Initiative. Yes, let's cut down the forests to save them, right? It's a, 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 a Operation Iraqi Freedom, which originally, by the way, was named Operation Iraqi Liberation. Remember that? It lasted for one day until they discovered that the acronym was O-I-L. <laughs> Change the name just like that. But deeper than framing is the concept of identity. And identity is something that we really need to get because framing is really just the tip of the surface. It's just one piece of, of, of probably 20 or 30 different methods um, used in, in NLP and other forms of, of, of therapy and psychology and communication and linguistics to understand and enhance communication. But identity is something that, as Kenny was talking about, gets right down to the limbic brain. This is the core stuff, who I am, who, you know, what, what tribe I'm part of, who my family is, what my identity is, uh, what nation I'm part of, what community I'm part of, who, you know, who's, who's with us and who's against us, to paraphrase badly George W. Bush. These are things that, that really are, are burned into our DNA. You know, an insect, a bee, know, knows which hive to go back to. Uh, virtually every form of life has some sense of tribalism or community associated with it. This, in, in, a, in a very real way, again, like that scalpel, can be something that, it, that, that heals, that brings us together, that allows us to, to help and nurture each other. I mean, here we are, the Bioneers tribe, or it, the dark side of it or the dangerous side of it, it can be used against us. And, and conservatives and, and, and Republicans, and not, not, not an unnoticeable number of Democrats as well, have been doing just exactly that over time. They have been, uh, for example, back in the 70s, Richard Nixon said, let's do the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy was a euphemism for let's promote racism. Let's try and get all those racist Democrats in the South and bring them into the Republican Party. And I, I remember I, I spoke with Bill Moyers. I interviewed him on my radio program last year. And he was in the office with Lyndon Johnson when they came in with the Civil Rights Bill and said, OK, here's the final draft of the bill. Are you really going to sign this thing? And, and one of LBJ's advisors was standing there. And, he, and, and as Bill Moyers related to me, he said, and, this, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. This is not probably word for word. I'm sure uh, Mr. Moyers can tell the story better than I. But nonetheless, it really hit me. Uh, this guy said, you know, Mr. Johnson or President Johnson, if you sign this bill, the Democrats are going to lose the South for a generation. And LBJ said, if, again, paraphrasing, but essentially he said, if that's the price, if to the Democratic Party, if that's the price of doing the right thing, I'm willing to do that. And he signed that bill. And the Republicans... And it was, you know, yeah, it was a good thing. And the Republicans just leaped into that and said, cool, you know, we'll take the racist vote. And off they went with it. And thus we see the Willie Horton ads and the George Herbert Walker Bush ads. And then, and then they, they stepped off from the racist vote to the homophobe vote. And, you know, it's just, it's all about racism, homo, uh, homophobia, yeah, and uh, xenophobia. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, but the real struggle, if you, if you take the largest frame of all, the real struggle here that has to do with the, f the frame of identity, who we are. The real struggle is, on the one hand, corporations and so-called conservatives trying to convince us that our identity is that of consumers, when for a 230-some-odd-year history, and you know, really for, for you know, millennia, humans have understood that our real identity is that of citizens, that of participants in community, that of participants in, in a political process, in a local process. And this is a critical point. To be a citizen means to be a part of and a defender of. And here's the most important one, and this is the one that I'm, it's a tragedy they don't teach in civics classes anymore, to be a part of and a defender of the commons, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the streets we drive on, the schools that we use the fire departments, the police departments. There's all the physical f commons that we know about. And then there are also the cultural commons, the stories we tell ourselves, our histories, our, our notions of ourself, and on it goes. Uh, Jan Edwards is doing a great job with this kind of stuff about the commons. Um, and uh, I commend you to her. I wish I had her website right in front of me. I'll share it with you. But, but uh, you can, uh, there's so much good stuff about the commons out there. FDR and LBJ got it about the commons. They got it that 
that you know, Franklin Roosevelt in his Four Freedom speech, when in 1936, in, in July 27, 1936, when he was renominated to run for president, and he, and he said, a necessitous man is not a free man. Hungry people aren't free people, no matter what you want to call them. And I all the time get conservatives on my radio program who say, we shouldn't have Social Security, we shouldn't have Medicare, we shouldn't have uh, social safety net, all that stuff is socialism, we need freedom. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, a hungry person is not a free person. Oh, yes, they are. You don't, you know, it's a, and this is the fundamental debate. It's about whether we're a nation of consumers, whether we're a nation that defines ourselves by, and not just a nation, by the way, all over the world, whether we are individuals who define ourselves by what we have and what we can get, or who we are and what we're part of. And it's, it's just, it's just a, a very fundamental, fundamental notion. To be, cons to be a consumer... To, re to reduce a person from citizen to consumer is to infantilize them, is to reduce them to the role of being an infant. It is the, the fundamental whispered message of all advertising is you are the center of the universe. Right? This is the baby's worldview. And, and in addition to that, advertising tries to convince people that they're not good enough, they're not sufficient enough, they're not complete enough without this product. Right? And, and, and so, you know, thus we bring about uh, this, this whole notion of greed is good and stuff brings happiness. The reality is a certain amount of stuff will bring a certain amount of happiness. I wrote about this in Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. You know, if you're cold and naked and hungry and outdoors alone at night in the, in the woods, uh, you're going to be unhappy. You know, I think we can all agree on that. If somebody takes you in, you know, and says, well, here, you know, here, here's some clothing you can put on, here's a fire you can sit next to, here's a nice bowl of soup, here's a bed you can sleep in, you're going to go from unhappy to happy pretty fast. And stuff made it happen, right? So there is some truth to the idea that stuff can make you happy. But this is where, then, the, 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 the cons take this the next step, and this is where it gets nutty. They say, okay, if this much stuff will make you that happy, then twice as much stuff will make you twice as happy. Ten times as much stuff will make you ten times as happy, a million times as much stuff will make you a million times as happy, and Bill Gates lives in a state of perpetual bliss. <laughs> and, and the reality, as we know, is that that's not true. That is one of, the, one of the most toxic lies of our culture that is shoved down the throats of our children every single day in television advertising, in advertising in our schools, right across the board, and not just our children, I mean, you know, adults uh, as well, but this is... This is one of the big lies. And it has to do with creating a frame that has to do with identity. And this is just, you know, ultimately what's at stake here is the branding of the United States of America as well as the branding of citizenship around the world. And there are very powerful forces that want to brand, to, to take citizenship out of the branding and replace it with consumerism. And so what do we do about this? How do we communicate effectively? What are some of the tools, very quickly, that we can use to, to change the dialogue and to bring this back? The first is establishing rapport. Rapport is, is establishing, hey, we're, we're humans here together. When I get conservatives on my radio show, for example, and I do this fairly frequently, I find actually it makes better radio to get people on that I disagree with than people I agree with, you know? And, and, and some very interesting conversations come out of it. The first thing that I'll try and do is find common ground. You know, we both love this country. We both, you know, we both live in this country. We, you know, find some kind of common ground. Establish rapport. You, in order to have any kind of effective communication, you know, we all have people in our families who are of different political persuasions, who, you know, people that we work with, people that we have to talk to around the water cooler, whatever it may be. Find some commonality. Communication is not possible without first establishing rapport. And establishing rapport usually begins by finding common ground of some kind and then stepping off from that common ground into the areas where, where we digress so that there's a foundation to come back to. Because we, we have to be, we're still related at the end of the day. We're still friends at the end of the day with these folks. The second is to be multimodal. The, the, the three primary modalities that people experience the world through, that most, that most people uh, understand the world through, are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic are their feelings. And Interestingly, people will reveal to you how they experience the world by their use of language, by their use of predicates. About seven, in our culture, and this is very interesting, this is purely cultural, in, in, I've worked in Aboriginal and Indigenous cultures on four continents, and my experience has been that in Aboriginal and Indigenous cultures, about 80% of people are kinesthetic. You never see that in, quote, Western culture or modern culture or whatever you want to call it. In our culture, about 75% of people are visual, and what they will say is things like, I see what you're talking about, that's clear to me. You know, and they're using language of visual, okay? I have people on the telephone who, as, as a way of saying goodbye, say, I'll see you later. You can't see me now. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah. Uh, 
but they experience the world visually. Other people experience the world auditorily. They'll say things like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I really like the sound of that. Hey, great to hear your voice. I'll talk to you later. And then some people experience the world kinesthetically. They, they experience the world through their feelings. They, they like to touch. They like to hug. They talk about, hey, I can get my hands around that. That's a good solid. I have a good feeling for that. I, you know, like that. I'll catch you later. You know, and, and that's, and, you know. And, and so when you're communicating with a group of people or when you're writing as I do or if you're doing media like I do, try to use all three. I mean, I'll make a point to string them all together into a sentence. So I'll start out saying, you know, I want to talk to you today about the stories that we tell ourselves, the way we view the world, and the way that we all feel as Americans. I think that's how I opened this conversation. <laughs> so some visual people in the room are going, I see that. You know, auditory people are going, oh, yeah, I hear that. That makes sense. And the kinesthetic people, oh, it feels good to me. <laughs> so notice that. And notice when you're communicating with other people the kind of language that they're using and echo it back to them. It's, this is not about manipulation. This is about stepping into another person's world and being there with them, for those of you who are kinesthetic, or seeing it the way they see, for those of you who are visual, or hearing the same stories that they hear for those like me who are auditory. Always try to chunk up to the bigger picture. Always ask, you know, okay, if this is so, what, is, how, how do, what does that have to do with democracy? What does that have to do with humanity? What does that have to do with, with, with life? What does that have to do with the future of life on Earth? Where does that take us to? What's the logical result of this? So very often we get caught in these little debates about little issues, and in fact, that's one of the ways that, that, con, that corporatists, con, uh, uh, conservatives, and, but in particular the corporatists have, have grabbed so many debates is by is by staying at the level of the micro rather than the macro. You know, they're talking about um, two guys kissing in San Francisco versus civil rights. You know, let, let's take it from small stuff to big stuff. Let's look at the large frames. In every case, every opportunity you have in one of these discussions, ask yourself, those of you who can talk to yourselves in your heads, <laughs> ask yourself, what would it mean if we took, you know, if everybody, you know, how, if everybody did this, how, what impact does this have on democracy? Where does this lead us? Understand the unconscious power of language, of associating language with things. I want to just end very quickly by sharing with you a list that was put, to, put together back uh, in 1995. Actually, 1994 it was revealed. It was put together before that. It was put together by Newt Gingrich. And... Uh, with the help of Frank Luntz, and Newt actually uh, held training sessions where Republicans got together and they memorized these word lists. And for 15 years, for, tw for, for 10 years now, we have been subjected to, and you'll, and you'll catch these, you know, on the Sunday programs, we have been subject uh, subjected to this. Um, he essentially said, whenever, he says, use the list below to define your campaign and your purpose, oh, excuse me, here's the contrasting words first. Uh, often we search for words to help us define our opponents. Uh, remember that creating the list, uh, creating a difference helps you. These are powerful words that create a clear uh, and easily understood contrast. In other words, these are the words that whenever you're going to use the word environmentalist, whenever you're going to use the word Democrat, whenever you're going to use the word liberal, whenever you're going to use the word um, uh, you know, any, anything that we would consider positive values, now, you know, a green, a member of the Green Party, whatever, attach one of the, predicate it with one of these words. Decay, failure, collapsing, deeper, crisis, urgency, destructive, destroy, sick, pathetic, lie, liberal, they, them, unionized, bureaucracy, compassion uh, is not enough, betray, consequences, limit, shallow, traitor, sensationalist, in danger, coercion, hypocrisy, radical, threaten, devour, waste, corruption, incompetent, permissive attitudes, destruction, imposed, self-serving, greed, ideological, insecure, anti-flag, anti-family, anti-child, anti-job, pessimistic, excuses, intolerant, stagnation, welfare, corruption, selfish, insensitive, status quo, mandate, taxes, spending, shame, disgrace, punishment. Bizarre cynicism, cheat, steal, abuse of power, machine, bosses, obsolete criminal rights, red tape, and patronage. Now, that's a list I'm telling you. There are people who have memorized that list and, that, and, and use it on a regular basis. On the other hand, he said, whenever you are going to use the word Republican and the word conservative, precede it by the words share, change, opportunity, legacy, challenge, control, truth, moral, courage, reform, prosperity, crusade, movement, children, family, debate, compete, actively, we, us, our, candidly, humane, pristine, provide, liberty, commitment, principled, unique, duty, precious, premise, caring, tough, listen, learn, help, lead, vision, success, empowerment, citizen, activist, mobilize, conflict, light, dream, freedom, peace, rights, pioneer, pride, Building, preserve, pro-flag, pro-child, pro-environment, pro-reform, pro-workfare, eliminate good time in prison, strength, choice, choose, fair, pro product, uh, excuse me, protect, confident, incentive, hard work, initiative, common sense, and passionate. So 
what I want to, I just, you know, I, I, what I want to leave you with is just, uh, you know, a, a reality here that these folks are not unsophisticated, that, that there are billions of dollars, there are trillions of dollars at stake worldwide in the corporate takeover of the planet, in the transfer of sovereignty from an individual nation to an entity like the World Trade Organization or, the, or NAFTA, uh, where in NAFTA Chapter 11, our laws that we pass with our elected representatives are actually struck down by a group of corporations sitting around a table deciding whether our laws will be, will be legal. Uh, that's why, you know, the whole dolphin safe tuna thing and the, you know, there's, uh, you know, I don't have time to get into all the stories, but trust me, it's, it's just, we have surrendered our sovereignty with these trade agreements and it is making a huge fortune for a very small number of very, very wealthy people and very powerful corporations and ultimately the battle that we're looking at, and there's a frame for you, the battle, right? In any case, uh, I, let, me, let me mix frames, okay? The, the battle that we're looking at is the classic argument between conservative and liberal. It's not really right and left. The old left is gone. The old left was the, the old Marxists and the old communists and the people who believe that the government should own all the factories and the means of production and supply. And Joe McCarthy started taking them apart, and they're gone by and large. There is no left in the United States anymore. 85% of Americans say we should have single-payer health care. 95% of Americans are in favor of, of a healthy Social Security program. The vast majority of Americans want clean air and clean water. And yet, when they talk about these issues, they say, liberal, right? This, isn't liberal. this is mainstream. This is human. These are fundamental human values. And then on the other side, there's the right. There's the, there's the group who say, you know, well, no, we should surrender all our power to corporations. They are people, after all, you know. Uh, we should surrender all our power to, to corporations and just let them, uh, you know, they govern us because they know what's best for us and they can, you know, uh, do the whole thing. And, and it really, the debate really goes back to the debate between Sir Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine. In the 1790s, Thomas Paine spent two weeks at Sir Edmund Burke's home in, in London. Burke is the, the, the godfather of the modern American conservative movement. And you'll, you can read about him in Russell Kirk's book, The Conservative Mind, the book that animated Barry Goldwater and, and uh, William F. Buckley. And Burke said in a letter to, to Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, who, pro who proposed progressive income tax, inheritance tax, health care for all, uh, labor union, I mean, just the, the whole thing. I mean, Thomas Paine was the original progressive thinker. Uh, Sir Edmund Burke wrote a letter to him. He said, it does me no harm if a man is allowed to engage in as servile a profession as hairdresser or tallow maker, candle maker. But it does society great harm if such a man is allowed to participate in governance by voting. Okay. This, this is, the, you know, the conservative worldview of a, of a small, but very powerful, very wealthy aristocracy. And the, the rationale that Burke used was that would create a stable society. And he's right. The conservative worldview for 7,000 years held very stable societies. But we have agreed for 200 years plus now in the United States, that's not the kind of society we want to live in. We're willing to put up with a little bit of instability to have freedom and to have a quality of life and have a real middle class in America. And that's the ultimate struggle. That's the ultimate battle. So as we water the tree of liberty, to paraphrase Jefferson, as we water the tree of liberty with our words and our deeds and our actions, it can grow to a mighty oak that can provide protection for us and for our families and our children and future generations and for all nations around the world. Thank you.